So, this one is a real slow burner. Exactly the kind of story that I love. You'll see the tension slowly, slowly ramped up during the course of this story. And even in the end, you'll be left thinking, what did I just listen to? It's going to leave you with a lot of questions that you may need to answer yourselves. And you know what? I'll be looking forward to discussing this one with you in the comments section below the vid. <laughs> so, do you know what time it is? Do I need to tell you? <laughs> I don't, do I? Anyway, go on. Sit back and relax with your favorite drink, my dear, dear friends. Because now, it's time to listen. There it was. Every dime I had to my name. $432.66. How could this have happened to me? I was once at least middle class, but that seemed ages ago. The truth is, I was in this place because I put myself here. My indulgences, irresistible urges and the like. My story is nothing new when it comes to this. Sometimes bad things happen to good people, or <laughs> well, so the saying goes. I wondered where it all went wrong, but I only had to look in the mirror for the answer to that question. I stared at the balance in my bank account, and I knew time was running out. I had to make a decision. I went back over to the airline booking site, reviewed the flight information, and hit the book now button. I sighed with relief. I'd done it. New adventures awaited me. I'd been out of work for almost a year on the day I booked my flight to Boston. My friend Sam lived there, and had done me an enormous favor. Sam had found me a job in a local nursing home, work I'd always enjoyed. He'd also put me in touch with a house where I could rent a room. He described it as the perfect place for me. Now, Sam and I had been friends since childhood. We'd shared every devilish teenage prank secret and bad decision. He knew me and my life better than anyone else in the world. He knew my flaws, my strengths and weaknesses in a way no one else did. Quite simply put, he was my best friend. Based on these factors, I trusted his judgment about the situation. When Sam made the offer, I jumped at the chance. Okay. Maybe I didn't jump, but I definitely said yes. I'd been living with my brother, my sister-in-law, and three kids for the better part of seven months. The clatter and the clanking, yelling and crying that comes with this many people was too much for me. I had to get out, to be myself again, whoever that was. I definitely worn out my welcome. My sister-in-law, Beth, was going to kill me if I didn't move out. I saw the disdain in every glance, every stare and eye roll. I slept on the couch, each morning folding my blankets in an orderly fashion, placing them in the closet and resting my pillow on top. I tried to stay out of the way. I'd look for a job for a few hours, and then go out for a walk. I'd walk in rain or snow. Even when the bitter cold was unbearable, I walked. I searched for something to fill the emptiness in me, but I couldn't find it. Had I found what I needed, wanted, I could have been happy. But during this time, I no longer had my sidekick Sam. And without him, everything seemed different. I needed a job, a place to call home, and when I'd found it, I'd know. My brother Alan and sister-in-law Beth seemed happy I'd soon be gone. Yeah, they tried to disguise it, but any fool could read the expressions of relief and hidden joy. Yeah, they made all the customary, obligatory remarks. <gasps> They'd miss me. I could 
always come back, and so on. But I knew the truth. It was abundantly clear when they wrote out a check for the deposit on the room I'd be renting. A few days later, after the check cleared, I got an email from Margaret, my soon-to-be landlord. Dear Christopher, we are happy to have you as a new resident at Victory House. We seem to be the perfect place for wandering souls such as yourself. Sam has assured us you will be a wonderful asset to us as you have a unique personality and face some of the same issues in life as we do. Ours is a small, close-knit house, as I'm sure Sam has already described. However, we do have a few rules. Number one, no guests in any area of the house other than common rooms such as the living room, kitchen, and the main floor bathroom. Number two. We prefer limited use of the backyard, and the shed is off limits to anyone other than the keyholder. Number three. All kitchen garbage is left in the kitchen until the designated person takes it out to the bins. Number four. Noise must be kept to a minimum at all times. Number five. We eat promptly each evening at 6 p.m. If you will not be home for dinner, please make the person designated to cook that evening aware. Number six. No pets of any kind. Number seven. We have a home phone, but please let the machine pick up any incoming calls. Number eight. Please keep discussions between you and your housemates private. If you find issue with someone or something in the home, please try to resolve it amongst your housemates before contacting me. Number nine. Respect the privacy of the others in the house at all times. Number ten. Please see Michael, the house manager for any and all questions related to the house and its functioning. We ask you not to rely on answers from anyone other than Michael. As secured with your deposit, Michael will pick you up from the airport on the day of your arrival. Sincerely, Margaret Adams. On the morning of my departure, Alan took me to the airport. As I exited the car, he handed me a $20 bill. I felt humiliated, embarrassed. It was as if I were one of his kids going into the movies and this was my allowance. I hated him for it, but took the money. I was in no position to be too proud to take it. I now had $131.73. I grabbed my neatly packed suitcase and double bag, <laughs> the majority of what I had left in the world. We didn't hug. There was no, good luck, you're gonna do great. None of the normal things people say to people they love. What I did get was, hey Chris, don't fuck it up. He knew I hated to be called Chris. Christopher. Always. Christopher. Chris was not my name. He was happy to see the back of me, and to be honest, I couldn't blame him. Once I boarded the plane and found my seat, I plopped down and logged myself in. I scanned the plane for potential crazies, noisy kids, and looked forward to the drink cart coming rolling down the aisle. But then... I thought better of it. So before we took off, I popped a few Xanax. Beth wouldn't miss them. I prayed the tiny old woman sitting next to me wouldn't want to talk. I was in no mood. I braced myself for takeoff, tilted my head back, and closed my eyes. This would all be over in just a few short hours, unless something dreadful happened. <laughs> then it would be over much sooner. 
When I arrived at the airport, I called Michael, the house manager, who said he was on his way to collect me at the airport. He had a deep southern accent, which I wasn't expecting. I didn't have to wait long for Michael to pull up in the car, he described. It was an older model Buick, paint chipped off in a few places. He waved to acknowledge I had the right car. So I walked to the back door and began to toss in my belongings. Oh no, wait, he called out. I stopped in my tracks and awaited his instructions. Put those in the trunk. I don't want to mess up the back seat. I shrugged and approached the trunk of the car. As he limped toward the rear of the Buick, I noticed his size. A rather rotund guy, to say the least. I'd guess him to be in his late thirties, not much younger than me. He seemed friendly enough. After placing my bags in the trunk, we walked back around and got in the car. It had an awful odour. Stale beer mixed with meat or something like that. Whatever it was, it was disgusting. So much so, my gag reflexes kicked in for a moment. As I settled into the passenger seat, I pushed the newspaper in the floorboard out of the way with my feet. The interior of the car was actually stained with oil, dirt, and God knew what else. Why did it matter where I put the luggage? Not one to argue about trivial things, and completely understanding we all have our quirks. I let it go. As we exited the airport, I asked a few questions about Boston, and also about his work. He wasn't the talkative type, only saying he worked in a nearby plant. I quieted down, and just enjoyed the view of a brand new city. Though it was near the end of winter when I arrived, I was surprised to find it a mild day, temperature-wise. The sky was overcast and the winds were gusty. The car ride seemed to take about 20 minutes, but I couldn't be certain. On the way, I kept an eye out for places that might interest me. (laughs) Not historical markers, but places like Starbucks or McDonald's. Though I swore my drinking days were behind me, I couldn't resist counting bars and liquor stores just in case. Perhaps with a new job, new place, new friends, I might be able to have a drink within reason. Enjoy a cocktail now and again. It would still be some time before I could afford bars or eating out, (laughs) or even a six dollar cup of coffee. But one could dream. Michael eventually turned into a residential neighborhood, and I noticed the name of our street. So, we don't live on Victory. Why is our house called Victory? Because every day is a victory, dude. If you can get through the day in one piece and rest your head at night, then that day was a victory. It seemed a little optimistic for me at the time, but I went along with it. (sighs) Yeah, I guess you're right. I watched as we passed beautiful homes on a tree-lined street. But then, suddenly, the homes looked rather run down. We'd gone from beautiful to not so beautiful in a matter of a few blocks. But I really couldn't judge. Not yet. Above all, I didn't have to deal with my brother and sister-in-law and those kids. Here they said noise would be kept to a minimum. I'd be able to concentrate on myself and what I wanted in total peace. We pulled up to a home that could definitely use some repairs to the exterior. The steps to the front door were massive. At least 30, if not more. Which for me, an out-of-shape 40-something, looked like a mountain when I considered the weight of my luggage. Once we stepped out of the car, I walked to the trunk, which Michael unlocked. I removed the lighter of the two bags and began to walk toward the house. Michael stepped in front of me and I followed. I wasn't overstating it when I thought climbing the stairs with my luggage would be difficult, but I did it without getting out of breath, which gave me a boost of my confidence, if only a little. Michael opened the red door and said, 
<laughs> Welcome home. I set my bag down and scanned the room, which was sparsely furnished and dark. Only the muted daylight peeking through the sheer curtains and the bars on the windows. I noticed the windows had no screens, which left me uneasy. I have an unsettling, abnormal fear of many things. Bugs. Mice. Intruders. All of which are invited in by a window with no screen. The scent of the house was worse than the car, which before I couldn't have even imagined. In addition to the scent of stale beer and meat, the home added mildew and possibly some type of fecal matter. Even the open windows did not seem to aid in airing out the pungent odour. A sudden gust of wind rushed through the windows, blew the papers on the floor across the room, I could hear the thunder roll above us. I waited for Michael to close the windows. When he didn't move toward them, I did. As I began pushing the window down, Michael shouted, Hey, don't do that! I stopped in my tracks, looked back over my shoulder and grinned. I put my hands up in the air and stepped away from the window. Okay, crazy, I thought. No, I'm serious. Don't close the windows. We want them gone. Who? The ghosts. We keep the windows open so the ghosts will leave. Michael laughed. I'm just fucking with you. God, you scared the shit out of me. I thought you were serious. I thought I'd moved into a house with a bunch of nutjob ghost chasers. <laughs> no, no ghost chasers here. Say, smoke and bother you. He lit a cigarette before I could answer. Smoking did bother me, but I didn't say it. I closed the windows. Hey, Chris, let me give you a talk. He began walking toward what I could only presume was the dining room. Christopher. What? He turned around. Christopher. My name's Christopher. What I call you? Then he took a deep drag off the cigarette. Chris. He exhaled a plume of smoke. Yeah, same thing. No, my name's Christopher, not Chris. I assumed if he could have the quirk of being a slob, I could have the quirk of being called by my proper name. Hey, okay, Christopher. Now, here's the dining room. We eat every night at 6 p.m. Call if you can't be here. Got it. The room was actually quite nice compared to what I'd seen so far. An antique, deep cherry dining table for eight. Beautiful cushion seats and a china cabinet along the main wall. A massive chandelier was the only light in the room and hung over the table. It was actually quite beautiful. It reminded me of something my ex-wife would call exquisite. He talked a bit about the room, in between inhaling and exhaling on the cigarette. I followed Michael through the dining room into the kitchen. An absolute disaster. Dishes piled in the sink. Open milk container on the counter and beer bottles lined the side of the wall near the back door. That leads to the backyard, but we don't use it. He pointed to an old door. I could see the backyard through the panes of glass in the door. From the looks of it, I could see why they wouldn't go near it. It was also painfully obvious the only time they did use it was when they wanted to discard something. I was becoming anxious. I wanted to call Sam. I wanted to know why the hell he thought this would be the perfect place for me. The obvious answer was he'd lost his mind. But I had to know for certain. I needed to speak with him now. Michael was babbling about some nonsense of a so-called cleaning schedule. But honestly, I was only half listening, because I wasn't really sure they followed it. So I paid it little mind. 
I was focused on the scratches, the stains and scuffs on the linoleum, which was peeling away in places, buckling in others. I looked at the photos on the fridge. Happy people. I assumed they were my new roommates. I didn't ask that. I wasn't sure I'd stick around long enough for it to matter. But then again, where could I go? Just as I was turning my attention back to Michael, he asked. So? Got any questions? He stubbed the cigarette out on a small plate on the counter. No, I think this sums it all up. Good. Now let's go get your other bag and I'll show you your room. He removed his baseball cap. He was mostly balding and had a large scar across his forehead. He turned the cap backwards and walked back toward the front of the house. I followed, still taking it all in. I'd been searching for something, but this wasn't it. This would not fill that emptiness inside me. I couldn't imagine this ever being home. I needed to call Sam. Once Michael and I had gotten the other bag into the house, we walked up a long staircase full of all the creaks and wobbles one expects in a house well over a hundred years old. Again, the staircase lacked any type of light, other than that coming through the windows in the front of the house. When we finally reached the top of the dusty, cluttered stairs, he walked me down a short hallway which led to my room. He unlocked the door, then handed me the key. That's yours. Don't lose it. Cost 50 bucks to get a new one. Not sure if Mrs. A told you, but rent is due on the first. Late fees start on the second. No exceptions. I took the key and shoved it into my pocket. It felt so good to know that once I'd unpacked my belongings, I'd have a key to put on my keychain. I had to leave the key behind with my brother, which left my key ring without a single key. Now, I'd have a couple of keys. Maybe even some at work that would make me feel worth something again, if only a little. Michael pushed the door open. It was spotless, clean, and fresh smelling. I was pleasantly surprised. The window looked out over the street, and a small, comfortable-looking leather recliner was tucked away in the corner. The bed and dress were nothing fancy, but in my own way, they were mine. I could start a new life here, if only I gave it a little time. We took my bags into the room and set them down on the wood floor. Michael handed me another key. For the front door, he said. Thanks, let me guess. Fifty dollars if I lose it. <laughs> You got it. Well, good luck. We'll see you at six. Thanks. Why the hell did he keep reminding me what time dinner was served? As soon as Michael left the room, I dug my phone out and called Sam. But there was no answer. I decided to put my hundred dollars worth of keys on my keychain. So I opened my duffel bag and got out my guitar keychain. The same keychain that once held office keys, the door to my own car, my own home, and then my brother's home. Now, empty, it was ready to start anew with me. Then I tried to reach Sam again, to no avail. Where was he? I decided to walk about the neighborhood, to get acquainted with my new surroundings. As I walked back downstairs, the house was quiet and peaceful, just the way I liked it. I was giving up privacy living with these roommates, the number of which I was uncertain. However, I had had no privacy at my brother's. At least here I had a room to myself. Good enough for now. When I got to the front door, I opened it, stepped out onto the porch and locked the door behind me. The rain had turned to drizzle, so I didn't even bother with an umbrella. I didn't even remember packing one. 
The street was actually quite busy for a residential neighborhood. But in my brother's, we'd lived in one of those prefabricated, everybody's houses are the same suburban neighborhoods. A little kid sped by me on one of those little scooter things. A typical PTA mom pushed her kids in a double stroller across the street. A garbage truck roared at the corner. So, this was life in the city. I felt alone. Not really lonely, but just alone. Wondering if this would finally be the place for me. I dug my phone out again and sent my brother a text, letting him know everything was fine. He replied with, Okay. That's all. Nothing else. I continued about my walk, then decided to step into a convenience store. I bought a black coffee and a muffin. Four dollars, sixty-eight cents. I walked across the street and sat down at a bus stop. I wasn't taking the bus, but no one knew that. A woman started talking to me about the bus, how it was never on time, how she had to get to work at the hospital and on and on and on. I just nodded and tried to be polite. The muffin was dry, so I tossed it back in the back. Crumpled up the bag and threw it in the garbage can. Finally, I stood up and walked away. I heard the woman mumble that I was rude, but I just kept walking. The sun was breaking through the clouds, creating a thick, humid cover around me. I briefly studied a map before arriving in Boston, so I was certain my new job wasn't far from where I was. I followed the streets by memory until I found a one-story building surrounded by a well-kept, lush garden. Behind a bush, almost hidden if you weren't looking for it, I saw a sign. Garden Manor. <laughs> I know. Really original, right? I toyed with whether to go in or not, but realized the travel had left my jeans and t-shirt wrinkled along with the fact I could use a shave. They weren't expecting me for a few days anyway, so I ventured back to Victory House. The walk was 15 minutes at most, which was nice. When I arrived back at Victory House, I sat down on the two steps nearest the sidewalk and watched. I watched all the same things I'd seen before. The parents, the kids, this time a fire truck, but nothing exciting. A tall, thin guy, maybe twenty, walked up to me, looked down, and ascended the front steps. He didn't say anything, just looked at me. I could hear him unlock the front door and open it. <laughs> well, I guess that's one of my roommates, I thought. I daydreamed and thought about numerous things before ascending the steps myself and going into the house. The young man was nowhere in sight, and neither was anyone else. I went to my room, laid down, and nodded off to sleep. I awoke to the smell of food coming from the kitchen. I looked at my phone and the time read 5.26 p.m. I called Sam again, as well as sent a text, but no response. That wasn't like him at all, but I put the phone down and then headed to the bathroom to take a look at myself in the mirror before I went to the dining room. The bathroom was an abomination. There were dirty towels piled on the wet floor, a torn shower curtain. Toiletry seemed to be left on every available surface. Oh God. I took a deep breath, ran my fingers through my hair and went downstairs. I walked into the dining room, but no one was there, so I stepped toward the kitchen. I could hear laughter as I walked in. They all got very quiet, as one blonde woman, who stood at the stove, turned around. Hello, she said. Hi, I'm Christopher. I guess I'm the new guy. Yes, you are, she said with a faint lift of an eyebrow then pivoted back to the food she was cooking. 
To her left, I could see the plate Michael had used as an ashtray still sitting on the counter, which was disgusting, but didn't seem to be a problem for anyone else. I resisted the urge to reach over and dump the whole thing in the trash. So, Chris, did you just get here? A small Asian girl asked. It's Christopher. Yeah, I got here earlier today. Nice city. Cool, she replied. She was small, with black frame glasses that took up half of her face. She wore no makeup and appeared to be dressed in some type of pajama bottoms and t-shirt with no bra, which was fine with me. I'm Amy, the tall blonde said without turning around. She was attractive, perhaps 30 years old. Uh, nice to meet you, Amy. Oh, duh. I'm Chelsea, the Asian girl said. She extended her tiny hand and I obliged by shaking hands with her. I discreetly wiped my hands on my jeans. Michael will be back soon, and Arlo is around here somewhere, Amy said, but still with her back to me. Oh, okay, I haven't met Arlo. You will, said Chelsea. I stood in the heavy silence, not knowing what to say. I brought up various topics, but neither of the girls seemed interested in me or even telling me about themselves. Can I help with anything? I finally said. <laughs> sure, get the plates, Amy replied, still engrossed in her cooking. The door almost fell off the hinge of the cabinet when Chelsea opened it. As I watched Chelsea, I guessed her age to be about twenty. She handed me a stack of mismatched plates. You can just put them on the table. I went to the dining room and placed each of the six plates in front of each of the six chairs at the table. When I was back in the kitchen, I asked about the sixth plate. Oh, that's Daphne. I didn't ask any further questions and waited to be directed. Once again, I broke the silence. Hey. You guys know Sam, right? Yeah, Amy answered. Sure, Chelsea said. So, uh, have you guys talked to him? I can't get him on the phone. Uh, yeah, the other day he was here and he dropped his phone down the stairs. It broke, so I guess he just hasn't got a new one. Chelsea looked at the back of Amy. Yeah, I remember he was helping Michael with something and he dropped it. Amy said. Then she turned around. Amy's long blonde hair complemented her pale green eyes and fair skin. So, who's hungry? She asked in a very casual but upbeat tone. I'm ready, I answered. Me too, Chelsea piped in. Well, we've still got a few minutes. The others will be here soon. Amy carried a large pot to the table. Get the glasses, the drink pitcher is full, it's in the fridge. She called over her shoulder. Chelsea grabbed some glasses and put them on a tray. I opened the fridge to find another disgusting mess. But the pitcher was there as promised. I grabbed it and promptly shut the door. I filled the glasses, then Chelsea walked toward the dining room. I followed. There I found Amy putting out cloth napkins and placemats. Christopher, you'll sit over there. She pointed to a chair across from the table from where I was standing. I walked over, pulled out the chair and sat down. Mm, smells good, I said. It didn't smell good. The aroma of this stew actually made me a bit nauseous. But I was starving and beggars can't be choosers. Chelsea was setting a glass next to each plate. I heard the front door open, and in came Michael and two others. I assumed they were Arlo and Daphne. They entered the dining room and sat down at the table. The grandfather clock chimed, signalling it was six o'clock. They suddenly joined hands. I knew what was coming. Prayer, which I respected but I've never been much of a religious person. 
Michael sat at the head of the table and began to speak. I wasn't familiar with the language, but remained silent. When he was done, Amy stood up and began serving the contents of the pot. It appeared to be a stew. I guess they didn't have bowls, or they couldn't find them. So they served it on plates. No one spoke. So, um, Michael, I apologize for my ignorance, but what language was that? I asked. Hebrew? Oh, wow, I can barely speak English, I chuckled. No one else chuckled. Christopher, here at Victory House we respect all religions, so we allow each person to lead a moment of acknowledgement before dinner. What religion do you most align with? Um, hedonism? I'm sorry, you're a Hindu? Amy asked. Um, no, hedonism. Self-indulgence, pursuit of one's desires. It's a way of life more than a religion. Oh, I see. Well, prepare something next week, we'll have you speak, she replied. When she was done serving each person their food, she sat down. I did my best to choke down the food. The spices and vegetables were not exactly cooked very well, but the meat was tender, so I complimented her on the dish. Thank you, she replied. For such a beautiful woman, she was one of the most bland, boring people I had ever met. She was vanilla at best. For the remainder of the meal, no one spoke. I still hadn't been introduced to Arlo and Daphne. As each person completed their meal, they would sit with their hands in their laps, completely silent. After everyone was finished, Daphne stood up and began to clear the table. Arlo helped. Good night, Christopher, Chelsea said, then left the room. Have a good evening. Michael said. He stood up and headed to the living room. See you tomorrow, Amy said, then also left. I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do, so I retreated to my room. It was boring. I had no television, no computer, and my phone had no internet. I hadn't brought any books with me, but remembered seeing a bookshelf downstairs, so I headed down to see what I could find. After scanning the shelf, I just grabbed a book, by someone whom I'd never heard of, but thought it had to be better than sitting in my room with nothing to do for several hours. When I got back upstairs to my room, I locked the door and flopped down on the bed to read for a bit. I began the book, which to me sounded like the ramblings of a madman. It was all about world religions, and then about a bunch of other philosophical crap that really contradicted itself at every turn. It was confusing, which irritated me. Then, the silent house was filled with a loud, plucking, strumming sound, as if someone were playing an instrument. I stood up and went to the door. I opened it and stuck my head into the hall. It was coming from the room two doors down. I stepped into the hall and followed the sound, but the door was shut. I wasn't sure whose room it was, so I made my way back to my room. For the next three hours, this noise went on. I was tired, but couldn't sleep with the racket, so I unpacked my belongings and tried to read the book again. I must have eventually fallen asleep while reading. The next morning, I woke to bright sun shining in my face. I had no plans for the day, but knew it needed to start with coffee and a shower. I walked downstairs to find the house empty. I ventured to the kitchen, which was even dirtier than the day before, but found coffee, coffee filters and the coffee maker. I started the coffee, then headed upstairs to the shower. I went to my room and got a change of clothes and my toiletries and headed down the hall for a shower. Once in the bathroom, I turned on the water, undressed and stepped in. The warm water and suds of soap and shampoo 
were making me feel better already. Once I finished my shower, I got out, dried off, and got dressed. I still needed a shave, but decided to leave it for now. I left the bathroom, went back to my room, grabbed my phone, wallet, and keys, threw my stuff from the bathroom on the bed, and headed downstairs for my coffee. Once I'd poured the coffee, I went outside. I sat down on the steps and just watched the comings and goings of the neighbors. No one came in or out of our house. After finishing my coffee, I took the cup back to the kitchen and left the house. I wandered the neighborhood until I found my way back to the bus stop I'd sat at the day before. This time I decided to catch the bus when it came. I didn't know where it was going, <laughs> but what the heck, I thought. When the bus arrived, I boarded, paid the fare and took a seat. I watched out the window as we stopped, drove, stopped drove. Eventually, I just picked a spot and jumped off when the bus stopped. In this area of the city, things looked very upscale, very modern, but I had no idea where I was. I pulled my phone out and tried to call Sam. No answer. I continued my walk until I passed a McDonald's. I walked back and went in. I found something to order that I felt I could afford, got my food and sat down to eat. The meal was nothing exceptional, as expected. When I was done, I threw the remainder in the trash and walked back onto the street. I called Sam. Hello? Sam? Yeah. Where the hell have you been, man? Sam let out a sigh. Didn't they tell you I broke my phone? Yeah, but I was starting to worry. So, uh, about the house. Man, I appreciate you trying and all, but I don't think it's for me. Give it time. I think you'll like it, but you've got to give it time. You want to meet after work? I asked. Sorry, not today. Work's been kicking my ass. Later this week, maybe. Now, listen, man, I gotta go. I'll call you later. He hung up. It wasn't how I expected my first few days to be. But again, nothing was ever how I expected it to be. I spent the afternoon exploring the city. I made it back to the house about five o'clock and headed to my room. A few minutes before six, I went downstairs, where I found everyone gathered around. I sat in the seat I'd sat in the previous night. This night wasn't much different, except I was formally introduced to Arlo and Daphne. The food was almost the same too. No one talked. I felt uncomfortable and the meal was gross. As everyone departed from the dining room, I asked if maybe I could watch some TV, which at this point I hadn't seen anyone do. You can watch a movie, Arlo said. No, TV's fine, I answered. Well, all we have are movies. We don't watch TV, he replied. You see, we believe television warps the truth. People get drawn into the news and other lies they want us to believe, Daphne said. Hmm, then a movie it is. You can find them beneath the television, Michael said. Anyone want to join me? They all mumbled no and shook their heads. I headed to the living room, knelt down on the floor in front of the TV, and dug through a stack of DVDs. The selection was poor, but I decided the best choice was Sweet Home Alabama. <laughs> Reese Witherspoon was worth the sacrifice. As I slid the movie into the DVD player, I could hear Arlo and Daphne talking in the kitchen talking like normal people. Had I offended them in some way? Why didn't no one ever have anything to say to me? I thought they were close-knit and I would fit right in. That's not what was happening. I wanted, no, longed for solitude, but thought at least I'd feel comfortable here. I thought perhaps this would be the opportunity to form bonds again. 
but it wasn't going to happen, it seemed. They made me feel like a new kid at school, who no one wanted to eat lunch with. I found the remote. After several minutes of messing about with it, I got everything to work and started the movie. I settled in the best I could on the broken sofa. A heavy breeze blew through the unscreened windows, but I tried to just focus on the movie. I dozed off during the movie, and when I awoke, the house was dark, with only a streetlight illuminating across the room. Pulled out my phone, and indeed, it was 11 p.m. I had to be at work the next morning at 8 a.m. I turned off the television and went upstairs. I heard the damn plucking of the string instrument again. It sounded like a dulcimer, maybe. Once I crawled into bed and nestled under the covers, I heard a rhythmic knocking on the floor of the room above me. <laughs> maybe Arlo getting laid. I didn't care. But where was all the silence I'd been promised? I expected for it to be as quiet as it was any other time in the evening, and that it would just be the same. The front door slammed shut, and I heard heavy steps coming up the stairs. The footsteps stopped directly outside my own door, and I could see the shadow of someone standing there. Then there were whispers. I anticipated a knock at the door, even toyed with the idea of just going to the door to see who was there. But these people were so odd, so secretive, I just wanted to stay by myself. I remained in the bed and hoped they would go away. When I dressed that morning, it had felt so good to shave and put my scrubs on again. I walked to work and entered the doors of Garden Manor. I was exceptionally excited to start my new job. I introduced myself to the receptionist who told me Elaine, my new boss, would be out shortly. And she was. A tall, dark-skinned woman with a toothy grin. I was relieved to see her happy face. We went to her office where we talked, filled out paperwork, and then took a tour of the facility. It was bright and clean, a welcomed addition to my new life. She introduced me to a few co-workers. It was really a typical first day, just learning the routines and so on. In fact... It was such a nice day. I dreaded it when the time came to go home. It was the first I could remember wanting to stay at work. But I said goodbye at the end of the day and walked home. When I arrived at Victory House, everyone was gathered in the dining room. We did the same thing as the previous evenings. But on this night I went for a walk after dinner. This was not what I wanted, what I planned. The next day was about the same, but when I arrived home in time for dinner, the house was empty, completely silent. Where was everyone? I went to the kitchen, dark and silent as well. A mouse ran across my shoe. That was the final straw. I had to leave. I had to go to Sam's for the time being, then I'd move to the YMCA if I couldn't live with him. The morning after I'd first moved in, after I'd unpacked everything, Michael took my bags down to the basement. I didn't have a key, but remembered a set of keys hanging near the front door. I walked to the door, grabbed the keys off the wall, and headed toward the basement. After trying a few keys, I finally found one that unlocked the basement door. It had the same pungent odor as the rest of the house. I pulled the string on the light above my head, and ever so quietly, I descended the stairs slowly. When I reached the bottom, I was shocked at what I saw. Boxes, furniture, cleaning supplies tools all perfectly organized, labeled, and the basement was spotless. I peeked around, snooped a bit to see if I could possibly make any sense of this house. 
To the naked eye, there was no logic or reason to the way they lived or how they behaved. I searched for my suitcases, which I could see in the distance, tucked away behind a deep freezer. The freezer was unlocked, and for some reason I just wanted to be nosy, so I opened it. When I saw the contents, it made me sick. I grabbed a bucket and began to throw up. Now, Sam and I had delved into some really twisted shit in our day. We'd gone as far as I thought either of us would ever go. But this was new to me. I didn't like this at all. I wiped my mouth with my shirt, closed the freezer and took a deep breath. The door that led to the basement slammed against the wall when it opened. Heavy, booted footsteps fell as someone made their way down toward me. I scooted into a nearby corner to hide. A second person was following the first person down into the basement. Even though I knew someone was there, and undoubtedly they knew where I was, I held my breath, hoping they would leave. Then... I heard a familiar voice. Christopher, come out. Sam. I stepped into the room away from the corner. Sam? <laughs> yeah, Chris. What the hell, man? You scared me. Then I saw Michael limp behind him. Christopher. Yes. <laughs> come out, Christopher. We just want to say welcome home. I see you found some of our secrets, Sam said with a grin. I don't know about this man, I told Sam. <laughs> I told you you'd like it here. Just give it time. I found some new adventures for us, Sam replied. I couldn't help but smile. After all. Sam knew me better than anyone. Well, I did warn you, didn't I? So, what did you think of that one? Many, many questions left unanswered. What exactly were they eating? What was in the fridge? What was up with his friend Sam? Why do you think he was going to enjoy living there after all? Hmm, I've got my theories, but I'm really looking forward to hearing you tell me what you think as well. So don't be shy. Leave a comment and we'll talk about this one, okay? All right, it's been my pleasure as ever. I know some of you are expecting my um, serial killer recollections video tonight. Well, that's going to come out real soon. I'm having an extra special thumbnail designed especially for it. So, that one will be up soon. I'm away to England next week, but my videos are all ready and scheduled for you, so there won't be any gaps. Don't worry, I'm not going to leave you going wanting. <laughs> okay, that's enough for me tonight. I'll see you all real soon. Okay? Bye-bye, and sweet dreams.